Thank you very much for that introduction. It's uh, a great pleasure and a privilege to be able to uh, talk here at the Society today. Uh, we have, um, as some of you have already seen, some items from the Society's collection and at the end of the talk you'd be most welcome to come and have a look at those. Now I'm going to explain why I'm dressed like this. This is not, I assure you, my normal day wear. <laughs> well, it's actually quite comfortable. Um, <laughs> But uh, it, is, it is for a purpose other than gratuitous dressing up, although my head of department doesn't believe me. I'm going to be talking quite generally about seals and sealing practices to provide a context. Uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Philippa, who's going to talk through uh, the project and some case studies. And then I'll return with a couple more case studies. And at the end, we're very happy to take questions. First of all, what is a seal? Well, if you're expecting one of those, you're at the wrong learned society. A seal is a concept, uh, it's an idea of representation and identity, and it's manifest in physical form through a number of ways, through seal matrices, impressions they make in soft material, and casts that are taken from both matrices and impressions. Just briefly looking at matrices, dyes or stamps. Uh, I'm sure that most people are familiar with at least the idea of a signet ring. Incidentally, how many people have a signet ring? Yes, I always get a few. So I think this is probably the last vestiges that most people have of carrying with them a seal matrix. They come in the form of a ring, but often they, far more often actually, they come in the form of stamps, uh, a little disc of, wa of, of metal, quite usually, sometimes with a taller handle. We have some here on display. They can be quite large and grand, made of precious metals. This is a silver matrix now in the British Museum. This is a gold ring. And it's actually set with a stone that was engraved as a seal in the ancient world. You can tell if you've got a signet ring or it's just a, an ordinary ring with a design because to make the impression, the engraving has to be done into the surface to produce a raised impression. But a large number of the seal ma dyes matrices from medieval Britain or base metal, lead or pewter or copper alloy. Most of them were designed to make a single impression in a soft material, but sometimes you'll get two plates which are designed to squash that soft material together to form a double-sided impression. We know a little bit about who made these matrices. Certainly goldsmiths made matrices, there's an account from the Abbey of St Albans where uh, a, a worker there, probably a monk, certainly somebody affiliated with the Abbey, called Anctil in the 12th century, was discovered to have been up to no good. And he and a couple of other monks have clearly been forging things and siphoning off precious metals. And when he fled, because he didn't want to um, face up to what he'd done, a half-finished seal matrix was found on his bench. So we have insights such as that. We have payments to London goldsmiths for making the great seal, the seal of the monarch. And there are a number of specialist seal makers who operated certainly in larger urban areas. My colleague, Dr John McEwen, has done quite a lot of work on seal makers from medieval London, for example. And there, here I come to why I am dressed exactly like this, because this is as far as uh, we can tell right for a woman of moderate status in the late 13th century. And the reason I do this is because we know through Dr McEwan's work that a woman called Alice took over her husband Henry de Keller's business of seal making after his death. He had a shop at the edge of St Paul's churchyard and the records clearly show that she took over the business and carried on making and supplying seals. And I became very interested in this, how, how, first of all, a woman taking over a business such as this, but how practical was it? 
And actually, it is quite practical. This is, as I mentioned, remarkably comfortable, though a little warm for centrally heated buildings. But the long sleeves very easily turn back so that your hands are free. In fact, you can take the sleeves out so that you have, again, more freedom of room and you push the veil back. It's actually quite practical. But she was a well-to-do merchant's wife and widow, so when she went to church or out to, to visit people, the sleeves would come back down, the veil back down, and maybe the belt off to have a longer dress. So it's quite, I, th I do think that it's important that we, we don't just read these things, that we actually try and see how people lived and worked I in the past. This outfit is also quite similar to another woman who uh, Philippa is going to discuss, a seal user in this case. In terms of making seals, there was also an element of mass production. A number of stone moulds have been found which make blank discs, and in fact several blank or half-made discs have been made. So an element of technology, again we might not think of, perhaps we think of just very high status, very elaborate objects. They're not all in, in that, made in that way. And punches and stamps. And also all the engraving has to be done back to front to make sure that the impression is the right way around. It might seem quite simple, but this is quite sophisticated technology and a form of imprinting many centuries before printing in terms of text onto parchment or paper came to Western Europe. Now, these stamps, these matrices, were made to be impressed into a soft material. If I say sealing wax to you, what do you think of? Anyone? Parcels. Yes, parcels and physically, what, what, what sealing wax? Yes, I've already got people doing, doing that, which probably isn't going to show up on your recording. Uh, a stick of, of uh, something, usually red, maybe with a wick through it. That is, in fact, shellac or a modern artificial version of shellac. Shellac is an excretion of a beetle from Southeast Asia. So it's not what was used in the Middle Ages. In fact, what was used is true sealing wax, beeswax, mixed <coughs> usually with a little bit of tree resin, quite often with pigment added, verdigris for green, uh, that's copper acetate or vermilion mercury sulfide for red seems to be quite common and it was made up in advance and made into little cakes little discs which were then warmed up again when they needed to be attached to documents and then the matrix was pushed into this soft disc of wax which hardened and retained the imprint and sometimes quite often in fact it's not just the impression of a matrix you find on the wax. You find finger hand prints, and this is what led to our current project. Now, how were seals used? Well, they were used for closing things up. Somebody's already mentioned parcels. They were used, you put a blob on a, a, of wax, push a matrix in if you wanted to ensure that a folded up document hadn't been tampered with or a jar or a box. But the principal way of using seals, or the, the, one of their principal uses, I should say, in the Middle Ages, was as a form of validation and authentication, representing an individual or an institution or an office that was agreeing to an exchange or a, 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 a right, grant of rights that was in, recorded in written form. And instead of signing your name or putting a pin in as we would do now. A seal matrix was impressed to a lump of wax which was designed to remain with the document and that's what's crucial, that's what validated the document. Is anyone here from Norfolk? Right, oh, oh one person, prepare to be offended but not by me I hasten to add, by a monk from Peterborough Abbey writing in the later 12th century who thought that the people of Norfolk were not the hardest working or the um, most intelligent, shall I say. And he told a story about a group of unfree peasants who wanted to buy their freedom. And they went to their lord and said, we've saved up, we want to buy our freedom. And he grumbled, but he needed the money. So he said, all right. And they said, we want it done properly. 
we know that it should be done with a document. So the Lord called a scribe, and the rhyme is in uh, the, the, the story is in Latin rhyme, but it has a nice insight. It said the Lord pressed his seal matrix into the green wax, so we get that nice little insight that validated it. The peasants were delighted. They went off to the local inn, out just outside the village, to celebrate. Carried on celebrating, and it got dark. And the landlord said, I'm not lending you any money for a candle, off with you. And they thought, we're going to fall over, we're going to fall into a drainage ditch. Suddenly, some of you already got there, one of them said, but look, we have a ready-made candle. We have a lump of wax with a cord running through it. So they snipped it off and they lit the candle and they went back home. Next morning, the Lord banged on their the door and said, get up, you lazy peasants. Well, no, we're free. So he said, prove it. I will bring a justice. The peasants brought forth their charter. Justice took one look and said, no seal, it's invalid. Now, the point about that story is even a drunk Norfolk peasant by the later 12th century would appreciate the crucial importance of the document retaining its seal, that form of authentication. And they were used to authenticate a wide range of documents, some very formal charters and grants. Both of these are royal documents. These are just a random sample of small grants of land from across England and the parts of Wales that are adopted English law, and other types of agreements. For example, that is the sale of a serf and his family in Anglesey in the late 14th century. This is an indenture of apprenticeship between a master and his apprentice. And one of the details in this, each one would have kept a copy incidentally, and the zigzag line is because there'd have been identical text on each side, one seal one side, one seal the other in exchange, and you put them back together to prove they're both part of the original whole. But this one says that the apprentice must, must not have illicit relations with any of the female members of the master's household. And this is a bond, an ephemeral document, uh, and there must have been thousands and, th and thousands of these that then, once the exchange had been made, were no longer being used, so they've disappeared. But seals were not just about authenticating in the way a signature did. They represented and embodied in a way, and they're very good at representing a, an individual or institution in relation to their culture and their society. And you could use them as a form, if you like, of propaganda. So the king used the image of the seated figure in majesty. The higher nobility, certainly in the 12th and 13th centuries, used the equestrian warrior and then started to adopt heraldry. Towns um, used seals, that's Haverford West, monasteries, bishops, all representing them. And as you can see, fairly standardised image representing the, the image of that type of person. But then ordinary men and women used seals, really very low down the social scale, because even if you're exchanging a very small portion of land, you would need to do this, or a very small exchange. And there was a lot more freedom and experimentation lower down the social scale. So you find all sorts of, of motifs turning up. Um, whole menagerie of animals and birds, maybe something related to a trade. This is the seal of a carpenter um, and other designs of various sorts. And at this stage, I'm going to hand over to Philippa to tell you a little bit more about the project. Thank you. Yes, Elizabeth's told you all about those images on the front of the seals, um, but we're thinking about a new project. Uh, it's only been going for about a year, and that's what we want to talk to you about today. And it, because it's a new project, there are lots of things we don't know. There are lots of things we still have questions about. So we might be proposing suggestions about why things are happening. If you've got other ideas, um, if you've got suggestions to make other questions, please do make those suggestions or ask those questions, because they can help us think in a new way. The project, you've been told, is called Imprint, but actually that's its full title, because we're interested here in what, what forensic scientists can do to help us think about those seals. 
Uh, we're working in connection with a forensic company, Forensic Focus, who usually work for the Home Office. Uh, and they usually work on modern crimes, not on historical research. So this is new for them as well as for us. But what they are is fingerprint experts, finger and handprint experts. They're good at analyzing the prints that they get from, well now usually from digital images, which is what we're thinking about with our medieval seals. Elizabeth's already shown you one of those prints, but they're really what you get on the back of seals, and mostly they're accidental. You've had to warm the wax up in order to get that impression in. As you do that, you leave a print on the back. So a, a palm print usually then, though sometimes fingers or thumbs appear there as well. Some of them, as I'll show you in a couple of minutes, look a little bit more deliberate. Uh, they look like somebody has actually just pushed some fingers and, or, or knuckles actually into the wax. And we see those in, in Germany and France as well as in England, and they're probably doing something a bit different. They're, they're something that's quite interesting. Of course, whilst these are really interesting images, are great, and they're, you know, they're left behind by people who are thinking about um, other things. You know, so they're, they're, they're just incidental. They demonstrate the individuals who are involved in sealing. What can they do for us? What can you actually do with those? Well, our forensics experts can help us to match up some of those prints, uh, and they can help us to tell, to tell us when prints just don't match. And I'll show you examples of when both of those things are important. And we are talking here about prints that were left at the time. We're not talking about something I might leave on a piece of paper and you can't see. We're talking about something that's impressed into the wax. So it has to have been done at the time when the wax was soft. Okay, so it has to been done when we're actually, the seal was actually impressed. Now, we're not actually trying to identify individuals, um, but we are asking lots of interesting questions, I think, about society. And to give you some idea of what we're doing, I just want to show you a short film about the project. So this is in print. It's a collaboration between the University of Lincoln and Aberystwyth University. Uh, and it's funded by the AHRC, and the universities are represented by me and Elizabeth and by two research fellows, uh, Dr. Colleen Morgan, whom you'll see in this film, and Dr. Fergus Oakes. And as well as looking at the prints, we're interested in the whole document. You can see in this film that we're looking at those images on the front, we're looking at the documents attached to them, and we take photographs of all of those as part of this. We're adding them with information about the documents, their size, their shape, the their contents, who's involved, into a database. And to do that, to think about this, we're surveying large numbers of documents. Uh, we said we'd look at 1,500 seals, uh, and so far we've looked at about 5,000. They haven't all had good prints on them, about 800 to 900 have. Um, but we can see those prints on the back, and here we're doing some work um, with medieval wax recipes uh, we've made up, trying to see how they might work, what people are doing sealing, uh, and hopefully in a second you'll see how you might get that print on the back. Yeah, you see, pushing your, your wax, your, your seal, and the print's going to be left on the back. This is our forensic equipment. Um, it uses, the, you can go through the whole light spectrum. Uh, to see what you get, where you get the best image of the prints on the back. Sometimes they're viewable with the naked eye, but we can get better ones. And you can see, going through our, our different print colours here, we get the image on the screen, and when Holly is happy that she's got the right image, she can save that image. And we can pass them on to our forensic experts. To say, we're as interested when we talk to them about seals where the prints don't match it's about seals where they do. So, project. Based on a pilot, we did some work at Hereford Cathedral. We're very grateful to Hereford for allowing us to do that for a, the equivalent of a month's worth of work uh, and looked at about 200 seals to prove that we could actually do it together with our forensic specialists. Now we're funded for three years by the AHRC. And we're sampling materials you can see largely from cathedrals uh, and from Westminster Abbey, National Library of Wales, 
We're looking for collections we think of as closed collections, or to one institution, or largely to one institution, because then you often get matches of families, different members of different families across different generations. You get a certain pieces of land being followed through, which will help us. And we're interested in the chronological range, about 1150 to 1350, because that's the height of seal use. That's when lots of people are developing seals, getting seals, thinking about ways seals work, and administrative document production is changing as well. So we can put both those things together and to think about some key research questions. Really, what we're thinking about when we look at these questions is how were people doing the sealing? Who's doing it? Where were they doing it? How are they doing it? And what does that tell us about who's involved? Uh, for example, could we see that um, one member of a family seems to be sealing for all, all of a family, so we see just one print on the back of all of a family seals from a certain generation. Does it look as though women are allowed to do sealing? And our forensics experts tell us that the, you know, the size of the prints they can get sometimes tell them if it's a man or a woman. Do things change as documents change, as document developments change? And can we see evidence of things like forgery? Um, if I can see prints from the one that I can match to something from a different generation, for example, on an earlier document, maybe I can see some forgery, and Elizabeth will talk to you about that in a minute. And our forensics experts are also interested, because they want to know about technical challenges. They're looking at prints on uneven surfaces. They're looking at prints that maybe have been twisted round when you're trying to get something out of the wax and you've moved your, your hand round. And they're also interested in the viability of finger, um, fingerprints and in their uniqueness. Um, we are used to the idea that fingerprints are unique and that that will help you if you're ever accused of a crime. And I'm here to tell you no one's proved that yet. So congratulations. I don't know if that means you should all go out and commit crimes or just be very, very scared. Um, and of course, there have been some famous miscarriages of justice based on fingerprint evidence. There's fingerprints made up of different points different shapes, you know, how many of those have to be seen together before the print is unique. To get the statistical evidence that people need to prove that fingerprints are unique, they need a wide range of prints. 13th century prints are going to be great. Um, they're, they're really useful. You know, if we can match 13th century prints against modern, uh, put them in the same database as modern prints and say, they still don't match, that gives us something to work with. So they're really excited about that. But we're finding some, some other interesting material. I'm going to show you just a couple of examples. Hereford Cathedral. These are five seals, uh, all with the same print on the back. If I turned them over, they would all have different matrices on. They all belong to different people. Now that's interesting because it suggests that though your seal is you and your identity and it validates the document and says you give your consent to something, you don't necessarily insist in the early 13th century on holding the piece of wax yourself <coughs> when the matrix goes in. What that tells us about what people are doing and how they're thinking is an interesting thing we can think about later if you want to. But it's an interesting point to have made and they're Hereford Cathedral prints. That doesn't though mean that we don't think that there is any involvement of individuals actually who are involved, whose seals are being, matrices are being impressed. Because you get things like this. Though the knuckle prints, they're of absolutely no use for actually impressing the matrix. In fact, they'd have made life a bit more difficult. And I don't know if you can see very clearly, but there are prints around them, and those are palm prints, like they've been done the same way as, as, as you saw in the film. So it looks as though, after somebody has pushed the matrix in, probably before they take it out, hopefully, um, they push, someone has pushed their knuckles into the back. Why? Well, maybe the individual whose matrix it is isn't very good at impressing it himself, and he wants to, someone wants to say, prove that you really believe this, prove that you know you're really involved, prove to yourself and me. And sometimes they seem to have got it a bit wrong. Um, that's an Exeter print, and that's actually a bishop seal on the back. This is another uh, an Exeter print. That's 14th century. This is 13th. This, believe it or not, is that. And I think on this version, which is from the Crime Light Imager, from the forensic equipment, you can see better that there actually is some sort of image in there, like a ring's been pressed in. Uh, it's not very clear there. 
but something's gone very wrong with it. Probably this has gone very wrong with it. Again, you've got the palm print across the back. You've got, so the comments done, done what they that we'd expect, pushed in the, uh, the matrix, but they seem to have taken it out, turned it over and said, now you press your thumb or your knuckle into this. Oh, whoops, we've just ruined the matrix image. Never mind, never mind, we'll keep going. But it demonstrates that that's some of the ones, you know, that's part of the way that people could be doing this. We're also interested in how images match up with actual, with seals, um, with, with prints. This person, William of Hanover, has a well, nice matrix here, you can see, nice fancy image, and over here, only those aren't identical. They're very different. Well, very different, they're a little bit different. Okay. So, when he needs a new matrix, perhaps he's lost it, perhaps he's damaged it, perhaps it's worn out, he gets one that's almost identical. It's, it's part of him. He wants it to say something about him. But the prints on the back of these documents, and we have about seven of his, all different. They're very close in date, but they're all different. Again, he's not insisting on holding on to that piece of wax when he puts his matrix in, even though he is so connected with it that he wants the same image all the time. That's what you can get when you might get somebody who is um, involved in their seal, in, you know, who, who is very connected to their seal, um, who is very... Um, who thinks about that, that one particular image as them. It's interesting, I think, that he does think that image is him because it's not, you know, it's not an image of a saint he worships, for example. It's not an image of, um, that shows me something about his job. Uh, he's actually a landlord. That's why we've got all these documents because he just impresses his seal into receipts when he collects his rent from him for cathedral. But that's not the only way forward. Elizabeth said that we're going to talk about another young woman, another woman, uh, not just Alice. And this is um, one of our examples. Uh, this is a, a woman who seals a number of documents, and she's actually from Lincoln, so one of our other cathedrals that we were involved with. She's called Bella. She's the daughter of Alan de Heller, and on her seal she calls herself Bella Heller. Um, because she would, wouldn't you? Unless she's Bella de Hell, but that doesn't help much either. Uh, we don't know much about the family. They seem to have owned land in the city of Lincoln towards the east, a couple of parishes towards the east. Just a possibility they, they're connected to another de Heller family that own property outside the city, but it doesn't look very likely. The dates don't match up very well. Um, so they don't, they're not big landowners. She's comfortable, she has enough. And she lives in the sort of late 13th into the early 14th probably century, but certainly through the late 18th century, no, late 13th century. All of these are her seal. What's she doing there? Well, we can trace how Bella thinks about herself, I think, how she thinks about her status how she thinks about what she can do, maybe even her confidence, by looking at these different images. This is the first one over here. Now, we know that's her first seal because it's attached to a document and on the back it says, Bella has just been declared to be of age to seal documents. So this is the first one she's allowed to do. She's in front of the mayor. She's um, granting a bit of land in the parish of St. Roomwald in, um, uh, in Lincoln to a chap called William the Illuminator, who does a lot of deals with her. Uh, and she's, um, you know, it's land that her father's previously owned. If she's just of age, the youngest she is is about 16, probably, for, men, for leaving land. She could be a bit older, but you know, she's, she may well be a teenager. And she's picked up a seal, probably her first seal, because this is probably the first time she's been allowed to use a seal if she's not granted much land, any land before then. Uh, and the seal is very simple. You know, just what we think of as a sort of radial image, 
uh, like she's walked into a, a seal maker's of not a bad quality because the lettering around the edge is quite good it's quite nicely spaced not bad quality he said I need a seal and he's given her something cheap or something simple you know start with that um, put, I'll put your name around the edge of it and that's where she begins that's probably about 1267 a few years later she's making use of another seal and that's this one over here okay. now we know she's using this in the early 1270s because we've got copies of it more than one probably she's using it about 1269 so only a couple of years after her last seal because we have a document dated then issued by in her name and the sort of imprint on the um, on the wax on the tag the wax is gone the imprint on the tag the shape and the size would match that seal. It certainly isn't the little round one. Okay. So probably a couple of years later, she's changed her seal. She's making a number of grants. Again, largely the ones that survive are to William the Illuminator, but it looks like she's making grants to other people as well. She mentions other individuals in the parishes that, she's, that have hold land from her. And she's got a slightly better, and a slightly more interesting, maybe, seal. Um, the lettering is still quite nice and probably about the same quality as that. I mean, she's got, she's got a bit of money. She can afford you know, to get something of quite nice quality. All the letters are the right way round. And as this was said, you have to do it backwards, and they aren't always on seals. People do go through their lives with a seal with one L that always comes out <laughs> backwards. Um, but this is what we'd call a sort of stylized lily. You might think of it as more a sort of fleur de lis image. It's still quite a common image. It's not, you know, a very unusual image. But it is maybe a, a little bit of a step up from, from the radial image. So she's moving on. She's doing slightly different things. A few years later, in the late 1270s and 1280s, she's using this seal. Now, by now she's doing some really quite interesting deals. She's gone back over all those early grants of land she made and she's up to the rent. So where you used to pay a, a couple of pence to get land from Bella, uh, now she's charging you a shilling a year. Uh, she's, you know, she knows the status of what she's got. She knows the value of what she's doing. Uh, she makes an agreement with William the Illuminator where she says, Tiwa, I'll give you first refusal on any land that comes available that I have. But in return for that first refusal, you must pay me 12 shillings now, down. Uh, oh, and that eight shillings that you owe me a year, which is obviously now what is accumulated, you still keep paying that, okay? So she's, she's making good, uh, good deals. She knows what she's doing, she's confident. And this seal is much more elaborate. Um, it's got a, a, a more elaborate, um, this is again a sort of stylized lily, but if you look, it's much more sort of elaborate feathered impression there, more elaborate down here. Um, the lettering is still quite good, but it's perhaps a bit, bit fuller, a bit clearer. Um, the seal is actually a bit bigger as well. So in this case, Bella is using her seal to make a um, statement perhaps about her, her position, her confidence, her status, and she's doing that by changing it. I'm afraid I can't tell you anything about the prints on the back of Bella's seals because they aren't good enough quality uh, for us to be able to do anything with that. I was, I was hoping I could get prints of you know, a 16-year-old and we could look at different sizes of prints and how they've changed, but we aren't going to be able to do that. But she is a fascinating story. And at this point, I want to turn over to Elizabeth who's going to tell you some more fascinating stories. Thank you. Well, we go, we go now from a um, really interesting, very astute woman to somebody else from Lincoln, but this time a man who became a saint. This is Hugh, Bishop of Lincoln, uh, who was canonised, I've immediately forgotten. 1201. 1201, thank you very much. <laughs> um, he <coughs> was known to have been very active in terms of his involvement in documents and sealing. A lot of bishops, all bishops had a seal which represented them in their office as bishop and you find this standardised image of the representation of a bishop, there he is wearing mitre, carrying the pastoral staff blessing. 
That's not a portrait of Hugh, that's a representation of a bishop. And quite often we have um, circumstantial evidence that bishops would say to their clerk, oh, you impress that, or you, you, know, you carry that with you. But Hugh, from his life that was written, because he was deemed as very holy even during his lifetime, was said to have been very actively involved, that he requested that documents were read to him once they'd been written, that he was actively involved in the validation process, so presumably in the impressing of his seal. And you can't sit terribly well in this photograph, but I assure you that there are visible prints on the back of this and another of Hughes' seals in Lincoln Cathedral archives. And we're now double checking because we think we might have other impressions in possibly at Hereford Cathedral or in Westminster Abbey. And we are waiting for our forensic expert to come back and tell us whether any of those are matching, because if they are, we will have the fingerprints of a medieval saint. And the Middle Ages, I think this would have been classified as a very good relic of, <laughs> of a saint. And I've also mentioned forgery, or the misuse of authority. Again, we know that sometimes people are up to no good with each other's seals. Seals could be stolen, or they could be misused. But also, institutions could create additional proof for themselves. Westminster mm. Abbey was given a lot of land in the late Anglo-Saxon period, before the time when seals were regularly attached to documents. In the 11th and 12th centuries, when, val when proof was needed through the attachment of a seal, they suddenly had this problem. How did they prove they really held their land? So they found a sealed document from St Dunstan. Now for many, many years, scholars have assumed this is a creation of the later 12th century. It looks very much like an Anglo-Saxon charter of the 10th century, but it is wrong in just a few ways, including the fact that it's got a very large prominent seal, and particularly that it has the impressions of two different matrices, one on the front, a large one, and then one of the, on the back, which is exactly what you'd ex expect from a later 12th century document. But nobody's ever conclusively proven this. And it's covered in prints. And I would love to have been able to tell you whether or not we have been able to match those with other known 12th, late 12th century prints. But again, we're still waiting for the analysis. However, if we can do that, we will have solved a nearly 900 year old case of um, acquiring a little bit more than perhaps they originally had. So this talk really comes at a, 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 a period in our project where we're already getting what I hope you'll agree are some, some fascinating results, but it's raising more and more questions. And this one in particular brings together the historical interest, the, the creation of documents, the, the forming mm. of a sealed instrument, the accepting of a seal, the impressing of a matrix into wax as being so important, possibly a forgery, and the forensic side, because this is proving extremely difficult for the forensic experts to analyse, because it's very rounded, it's quite shiny, and so it's pushing them, it's pushing the technology, it's pushing this, and that, as Philip was mentioning, will help feed back into work that they do for the Home Office and police forces, uh, and forces more generally. So I think quite not, I, I spoke at a forensics conference last Easter and when my brother had stopped laughing he did say that he had never thought that uh, I would be involved in such hard-edged scientific research um, and there is still plenty more for those that are from the historical side. So I hope that this has given you an insight into seals, sealing practices, but also this new project and how we can use new technologies to investigate very old material. And as I said at the outset, we're very happy to take questions. Thank you.